There's this stereotype floating around that Russians rarely smile and are generally pretty gloomy people, and as much as I want to tell you otherwise, it does have some roots in reality. I mean, look at our culture, our history, look at this Soviet architectural legacy we have to live with every day, and you might see where it's coming from. Even our idea of recreation somehow involves suffering. Here, ask Tom Hardy. Oh yeah, <coughs> this is amazing, uh, this is good. Really? Yeah! Can I do that? Really? <laughs> yeah! Yeah! They're on the brink of a medical emergency. This experience isn't meant to be enjoyed. It's supposed to be endured. Hell, I dare you to check out our cuisine. Like this thing, for example. It's called Haladets and it takes forever to make and then it looks like this. And in that regard, Pathologic, a 2005's game by Ice Peak Lodge, is a distinctly Russian game. Much like Haladets, it's borderline unapproachable. I know, I know, plenty of games out there pride themselves for the unforgiving difficulty, but none of them do this shtick quite like Pathologic. It's nothing like Soul Sekiro born games or whatever the hell we are calling them these days. This game is not fair. It isn't supposed to be mastered. It is as far from power fantasy as a game could possibly get. It is pretty amusing for me to see people argue whether these games frustrating design decisions are intentional or not, when I know for a fact that Nikolai Tibovsky, the lead developer at the IPL, casually refers to his projects as torture devices. But the logic is tough. Cruel even. But the logic is a game about trying your best and failing. It's about trusting people and being punished for it. It is a game about disillusionment and futility of your actions. And it's not just the story. This design philosophy defines pretty much every aspect of the game. There are always some problems that demand your attention. You're always running out of something. Whenever you might think that you're getting a hang of things, but logic reliably finds some new and creative ways of kicking you in the balls. Which probably makes it the closest thing we got to a realistic Russia simulator. Anyway, I don't feel like digging too deep into the game as a whole in this video, but if you're interested, I strongly suggest you to check out the one by H Bomber guy. Um, can I take a minute to gush over his video? Well, of course I can, this is my channel, I can do whatever I want. So here I go. You see, in Russia, video game discourse sort of falls behind when compared with some western countries. It might be a huge generalization on my part, but at least to me it seemed that as of right now, not many people here are all that interested in discussing video games as something more than just entertainment. And for that there are several reasons that I'm not going to discuss right now. Long story short, there is a lot of this and not a lot of something like this. And as someone who both speaks English and is also super nerdy about video games, I sort of naturally gravitated towards the foreign critics. And as much as I love their stuff, I've always been somewhat upset that almost none of them played my favorite game ever. I always wanted for people outside my country to see all the bold and innovative things Pathologic did all the way back in 2005, way before experimental indie games of today. Sadly, whenever Pathologic did find itself in someone's crosshairs, it was usually something like great atmosphere, cool story, never made it past the opening hour. And then, one evening, I casually looked up YouTube only to be greeted with this bad boy in my recommendations. To be completely honest, I was kind of nervous when opening this video. After all, this thing right here might be the biggest moment of exposure this game I'm so passionate about has ever got since it was released. But all of my concerns were uncalled for. This guy gets it. And I mean he really gets it. There's just something so incredibly satisfying to me seeing this British dude picking up such a weird and alienating piece of my culture outsiders barely even heard of, and making a genuine attempt at appreciating it and then making this full-length feature film of a YouTube video to tell people why it is so special. And somehow this thing is way more entertaining than any video about pathology has any right to be. So please, I beg of you, with tears in my eyes, fucking watch it. I'll try not to overlap much, though I'll have to give you a really short story recap to make my point. Anyway, in Pathologic you take control of one of these three guys called healers as they arrive in this strange rural town. Not long after, the town gets struck with a deadly and highly contagious disease, and you are tasked with dealing with it. And by dealing with it, I mean that you have to walk around the town, talk to people and do your best not to die of one of the bajillion reasons, ranging from starvation to being burned alive by this good fella. <laughs> Each of the three routes lasts for 12 in-game days, which means that on top of the other things, you'll have to constantly worry about the time limit. 
Plus, during your first day as any of the characters, you'll get this cryptic prophecy telling you to keep a select group of people safe, that game refers to as Bound. And this is important, remember this. There is a lot going on in the story thematically. Determinism versus free will, traditions versus progress, rationalism versus spiritualism. Not to mention Pathologic's dark exploration of human nature in face of extreme circumstances. Those topics are worthy of their own discussions, but this is not what I want to focus on in this video. What I really want to talk about is one small choice you make towards the end of the game. But to get to that, we need to talk philosophy first. There was this guy called Albert Camus. And as the world was going to shit during the 20th century, with all the world wars and economic disasters and whatnot, as science deepened our knowledge yet failed to provide us with ultimate answers, and people in general became more and more disillusioned with dogmas of the past. This guy came up with the philosophy of absurdism. Well, of course, even back then, the idea that life is meaningless wasn't all that new. But it was him who wrote what many consider to be the main staple of this philosophy. I am of course talking about his 1942 essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. As you might have already guessed, his outlook on life was pretty grim. Life is absurd. The universe is silent and indifferent to our pleas, and where do we go from that? In his work, Camus described three possible outcomes. First one is, uh, um, well, it's suicide. Not exactly what I call a perfect solution, but neither did he. To Camus, an act of ending one's own life was seen as merely an escape from existence, a declaration of one's defeat. Second solution is what favored by many thinkers from Kierkegaard to Fyodor Dostoevsky. They believed that the only thing left to do when faced with a lack of meaning is to find something, anything to believe to, be it a religion, a spiritual idea or anything else really. This approach requires this irrational leap of faith that Camus considered antithetical to absurd. He called it a philosophical suicide. This option never worked for me personally and believe me, not due to lack of trying. Third one is offered by the man himself. In his essay, he calls Sisyphus an absurd hero, someone who acknowledges the meaninglessness of both his task and his existence and finds victory in this realization. He writes, Sisyphus, proletarian of the gods, powerless and rebellious, knows the whole extent of his wretched condition. It is what he thinks of during his descent. The lucidity that was to constitute his torture at the same time crowns his victory. There is no fate that cannot be surmounted by scorn. He continues. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. To Albert Camus, this embrace of the absurd is the only reasonable way to live with it. Sounds cool, right? Wouldn't it be nice to actually experience something like that firsthand? Not just read or hear about it and go, yeah, I guess that works for me, but actually experience it. Ah, uh, if only there was some sort of medium, some art form that could have put you in someone else's shoes by exposing you to some kind of interactive system or something like that. I don't know. Uh, anyway, back to Pathologic. As the story progresses and the epidemic ravages the town, the Inquisitor, a governmental official that specializes in making problems go away, arrives in attempt to prevent a global catastrophe. Later on, the army joins the party with enough artillery to make the whole town disappear overnight. On the twelfth day, both the army commander and the inquisitor gather at the local cathedral to decide the fate of the town, and, if all of your bounds are safe and sound, you are also invited to offer your solution to this crisis. That is how the game ends. You arrive at the meeting and present a way of preventing the pandemic that you come up with during the last 11 days, leading to one of the four possible endings. However, during that same day you will receive letters from other two healers, who you didn't choose as your protagonist. They will each tell you that they found their own ways of stopping the disease. They will ask you to cure their words, so that they could too visit the cathedral and offer their solutions. And let me tell you, this might be the hardest, though optional, quest in the entirety of Pathologic. You see, there is only two kinds of medicine that can cure the plague, both of which are incredibly rare. The only way you could make that happen is by going through the entire game without using or selling any of those items, while doing everything in your power to acquire them. This might be one of the two or three times my habit of pathological hoarding was rewarded. Yes, I'm looking at you, every other game in existence. So, this option is something for only the most dedicated of players. And what do they get for their efforts? Well, if you actually manage to help other healers, they will be invited to the cathedral as well. And you'll be given an option to choose their solutions over your own and see other endings, which is kind of neat, I guess. But there's more. 
If you assisted at least one of them, you'll get a letter from these mysterious uh, entities referred to as powers that be, inviting you for a talk. It doesn't really matter what character you're playing, at this point of the game you should be already aware of them. They are the ones who persecute radical thinkers, like say Stamachin brothers. They are the ones who threaten bachelor's work at the capital. And they are the ones who send both the army and the inquisitor. As a Russian player playing a Russian game, my brain instinctively, without me even noticing that, made this connection. Powers that be are this universe's equivalent of the Soviet government, that resides somewhere at the capital. By this time, you've already got a few increasingly ominous letters from them, reminding you of your duties. But this one feels somewhat more personal and even childish. And what's even more strange is that the place you're invited to is Polyhedron. This impossible superstructure that, according to some rumors, is capable of making children's games and dreams come to life. And that I totally forgot to mention prior to this. So you get there and... Uh... Mm. Yeah... I honestly get it why so many people were turned away by this twist. You work so hard to get there, only for a game to reveal to you that it was all in vain. This whole thing is nothing but a children's game, and Pathologic's universe is just as absurd as our own. As you leave the polyhedron, provided you help both other healers, you will receive another letter. This time it's from the makers, the people who executed the whole thing. But aren't they... Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? How bad could that be? This time you're invited to the town theater. As you arrive, you're greeted by these two. The executor and the tragedian. You've met them before. They are supposed to be performers at the theater, that also serve as tutorial characters and even orderlies at some point. What those two could possibly want from... Oh. So, that's what they meant when they called themselves the makers. Those two are a stand-in for the developers who invited you to discuss the experience you had with their creation. This fella will even go as far as to mock the character for being nothing but a children's toy, and then you'll have the option to tell him that it is in fact you, the player who stands in front of him. Then he will ask if you still wish to go on with your quest, knowing that it was all in vain. And it is this simple choice that really got to me and stayed with me for so many years now. I've known people who outright told this guy off and quitted the game never to return. And honestly, I get where they're coming from. Nowadays we have all those capitalistic practices in popular culture, with its abundance of sequels, prequels, quadrequels, spin-offs and extended universes, so people are conditioned to expect everything within the fiction to make perfect sense. That's why everything in existence now has its own wiki explaining every single detail of the made-up worlds. That's why we have all those obnoxious nerds on the internet arguing about lightsabers and power levels and whatnot. And uh, that is why we have things like game theory and cinema scenes. People are more interested with the content of the stories, rather than the ideas presented. But here, none other than the creators of the game directly acknowledge that the minute-to-minute -minute details of its plot aren't all that important. All that's left are ideas. It's all just a kid's game, within a play, within a video game, and none of this is real. But your experience with it definitely is. What you've seen, what you've felt, the conclusions you arrived at while reflecting on this game is what's truly important. Pathologic fully embraces the cosmic absurdity of its universe and challenges you to find the meaning for yourself in spite of it. It is a game that allows you yourself and not just your character to become an absurd hero. Of course, it isn't the first and definitely not the last time games commented on players' decision to continue playing. Bioshock's famous Would You Kindly twist or, say, the ending of Spec Ops The Line could both serve as an example of that. But in those games, at least to me, it feels like a shallow edginess. You're being scolded for experiencing them in the exact way you should experience a video game. You know, for playing them. And it's not like you're given any real ways of disobeying. Unlike those other games. Hell, I can easily think of one particular game that also happens to feature a mustachioed objectivistic Hover Hughes inspired arrogant dipshit keen on giving you orders that you can and probably should question. Pathologic, on the other hand, isn't interested in judging you for your decision to continue playing. It actually offers a complete version of that. 
instead of it being generally enjoyable game that shames you for enjoying it. Pathologic is a torture that actually, though in an unusual way, rewards you for sticking around. I cannot remember the other time a game filled me with so much determination as this one did, as I was making my way to the cathedral to witness its finale. Many games out there try to build up tension and remind you of how important your quest of saving the world, or whatever, is, but here it is you who ultimately decides that your journey had any significance. One can reply to that by saying, how are you even calling this a choice? We all know how choices in video games work. What changes if you pick one option over the other? To which I say, well, nothing really. The choice is, in fact, meaningless. You can tell him that you're fed up with this nonsense and just keep on playing as if nothing happened. Or you can choose the other reply and quit the game right after. But that sort of part of the charm. After all, the real game is what's happening between you and them. And it isn't just me. I can't quite recall anyone making this connection with the philosophy of absurdism, but the raw emotions and feeling of determination this game forces on its players is something that I see in virtually everybody who gave Pathologic a fair chance. Perhaps I am reading a bit too deep into this, but to me this tiny little interaction seems to be both a philosophical statement about existence and a meta-commentary about art as a whole. And for a game that bleak and depressing, it could not have been any more optimistic. Anyway, that was the video, thank you for watching. I mostly did this so I could lie to myself that I was productive during the lockdown. But if you feel like listening to my mumblings is your cup of tea, let me know and maybe I'll make more. Maybe I'll tackle something more mainstream next time, though I really want to compare Pathologic 1 with its sequel slash remake, so maybe I'll do just that. I have this firewatch thing happening in my life right now, except instead of watching fires I do some engineering, um, communication engineering to be precise. And uh, due to pandemic my shift is going to extend greatly, so even I don't know when I'll be able to upload next time. Anyway, please stay home, take care, and maybe I'll see you next time. Oh my god, you fucking kids! I've got places to be!